at the age of 24, I got the executive chef role forced upon me by circumstance. At the age of 24, I started a school called the Academy for International Culinary Arts with a buddy of mine. It's still open till this day. I was 2004, if I'm not mistaken. And at the time, I was 24. And the other executive chefs in my country, the Philippines, were the likes of uh, Norbert Gandler, uh, David Pardo de Ayala, Cyril, Che Gamboa, Fernando Aracama, and all these other big name chefs, and Philip Golding. So at the time, I had severe imposter syndrome. But then the reason why the title was forced upon me was because I had opened my first culinary school, uh, which was my thesis project from, the, from an entrepreneurship class at the Asian Institute of Management. Uh, my own teachers and classmates were very skeptical uh, that at my age that I should open a school. And the only reason why I believed I should was because I firsthand saw how others taught how I run my classes, and how disciplined, productive, engaged my students were compared to those of the other classes. I personally saw it. Um, Because prior to that, I was teaching maybe 100 students a year. And then, so, as it was forced upon me, I felt severe imposter syndrome. And that severe imposter syndrome lasted probably a good uh, five, eight years, five to seven years. And then as at, uh, at the time, people were calling me uh, fake chef, chef chefan. In my country, that means fake chef. Uh, you know how it is. Uh, the, the Philippines were known for hospitality, but what you don't know is if you work here, there's a lot of crab mentality in the workplace and disingenuous uh, <laughs> uh, people. There's, it's just part of it. Uh, if you're professional with integrity and excellence, you're part of the few. Most others, they're just there to collect a paycheck and gossip. And uh, not much has changed. And uh, that's why it requires a good amount of leadership in order to weed out the bad guys. But uh, that's part of being an executive chef. So this series is to help you, whoever you are, no matter what age you are, no matter what phase you are, uh, to become an executive chef. Uh, There's good news to my story. Uh, While I may have started out, you have to start somewhere. And when you're starting out, naturally the world, the industry will challenge you. And they will challenge you by calling you fake, hating on you, telling you you don't deserve to be there. And then lo and behold, I believe 10 years after that, dude, as executive chef, I was pulling in as executive chef. I was pulling in, my highest year was $350 million in revenue. Uh, and that I was 34 at the time. Uh, $350 million in revenue. So beat that. Uh, however, I, I only gained the confidence when I reached that point. But prior to that, I was operating with a lack of confidence. And so if you're operating in a lack of confidence right now, take heart. It's part of the process. You have to prove yourself. Eh? Uh, there, you will never feel ready enough to don the mantle of whatever title you're vying for. In reality, it's just a title. What you have to do is act for the role. Do the function the role requires. And uh, I'm going to share with you 12 things that I've learned uh, over the years. It's now 20 years later. Uh, now I train executive chefs for a living. Uh, my business is culinary education. I have since opened Global Academy. Uh, 10 years, probably 12,000 students. Sold that. Learned a lot in the acquisition. Learned a lot about the business. Uh, now in uh, Alianza, we're setting it up to be a college. A college of hospitality and hospitality tourism business. So that's key. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I'll share with you the 12 things that I learned. And what I want to share with you. If you are trying to become an executive chef, if you are currently an executive chef, but maybe you feel uh, that you are suffering through imposter syndrome, 
or if you just want to become a better executive chef. So this is going to be really quick. So here's 12 key areas to becoming an executive chef. Number one, that's understanding the role. It's a role. It's not a title. Titles don't mean anything. It's your role, your influence, and your function. So ultimately, the function of executive chef is to create the process and safeguard the process of profitably, or at least within budget, uh, producing excellent cuisine for your target market um, safely and within protocol and within standards. It's that simple. Uh, you have to understand basic economics and operations within the culinary sector. And you also have to, you have to understand uh, kitchen economics. So that's the role of executive chef. And you have to be very clear with what that role is. It's not about coming out in the magazine. That's marketing's role. Uh, they're just pretty much using your uh, stature, your uh, the natural excitement that comes with your role. They're using that one to market the, the brand or the business, which is a normal occurrence. And you should embrace it. You shouldn't shy away from it. Uh, next is culinary skills refinement. As executive chef, uh, you never want to ex- believe that you know everything. There's always something new to learn. Uh, at one point, I thought I knew a lot already about cooking. And then in came Ferran Adria. Molecular gastronomy was a trend back then. I had to relearn that. And then later on, the trends go out of fashion, which they all do. Uh, then later on, you have stuff like Noma. They bring in fermentation. It becomes a trend. And then it becomes too much already. And now you have open fire, which is a trend. So the trends just keep coming on. And you're going to have to uh, refine your skills and that of your organization. So that's uh, point number two. Point number three is your menu development and innovation capabilities Uh, to be able to understand menu development you have to be in tune with your competitors the fact that you have competitors who are striking gold means you're in a good market if you have no competitors in your market like for example the plant-based market you're all competing but you're all broke which apparently is what's going on now that means the market is just still not there Uh, the plant-based market is so small the fried chicken and hamburger market is just so big. And that's why you have big chains making a lot of money, employing thousands of people, uh, but you don't have that in the plant base. So the reason why I say that is you have to be cognizant of the uh, industry. You have to be aware of where the money is because where the money is is where the economy is. That's where productivity is. It's not about being mukampera. It's where productivity happens. So understanding the competitors, you'll be able to develop better menus. Traveling to other countries, you'll be able to develop better menus. And also, you have to understand the basics of innovation. Innovation is not just innovation for its sake. Innovation is where you can add more quality to the end user uh, through new means. Uh, Usually, it's a novel mean, it's new, it's fresh, it's exciting, but eventually it'll go out of fashion and then you have to innovate again. So that's point number three. Next is number four. You have to understand organizational dynamics because the higher you get in your position as executive chef, uh, is you're going to be within an organization and the bigger the organization, the longer it's been around, the more fixed things are. The newer the organization the more malleable the processes are, the more you can influence its structure and uh, safeguarding the integrity of the processes. And this requires a dynamic influence in your leadership and management. And executive chefs are usually made fun of by their younger counterparts that really don't know anything, that they're just desk jockeys. And that's not the truth. In fact, when chefs are in their desks, that's when they're actually resting because most of an executive chef's duties are with other people, fixing crises, fixing problems, adjusting food costs, uh, trying to grow revenues, uh, fixing things that are broken processes or dealing with terrible employees or uh, giving a nice path for good employees to rise the ranks. So whenever a chef is at their desk, honestly, trust me, they're just resting. It's really a people job now. Uh, Next is kitchen and operations management. To be executive chef, you want to understand 
kitchen and operations management. So this is the physical properties and it's also the other resources. Everything from purchasing and procurement. You have to understand everything from fire suppression, the tiles, the flow of food, HACCP, food safe, shape shop, whatever. You have to understand those things. And you have to also understand that the way that you design your operations ultimately uh, ultimately affects your bottom line, the costs that you incur. And it's very difficult because the kitchen, while it's a producer of revenue in terms of product, it is also a very heavy burden on cost. And if you are not a good executive chef, you can easily bloat up your cost uh, thinking that you're making things efficient. In reality, the meaning of efficiency is to be able to do the most impact with the least amount of resources. So you got to understand that. And if you can understand that and actually operate that way, then you have 0.5 dialed in. Next up is people again. Leadership, team management, and negotiation skills. And mind you, you manage downwards. That's your staff. You manage sideways. Those are the other departments. And you also manage up. You probably report to the general manager, the president of the corporation. Later on, you're going to meet with the shareholders or the board of directors. You have to understand the dynamics of the organization and corporate governance so that you can effectively uh, do well in your role. Because ultimately, you don't want to just end up as executive chef. Later on, if you're going to stick around in that organization, you want to be the president of the company. You want to be in the board of directors or managing director. That's where you want to go. You don't want to spend your entire life in the kitchen uh, tasting food and getting fat. You want to be able to take care of your health. Right? So understanding the dynamics of the organization is key. And it took me a while to understand this because as chefs, especially in the generation that I started in, uh, we were a very self we, we like to focus on our role as highly important. Although it was, uh, you need to be able to work with other departments properly so you can get further and you can leverage the team to produce better results. Next up is point number seven. Uh, if you're going to be executive chef, meron tayong tinatawag na profit and loss responsibility. This means you have income responsibility of the business. And if you're stuck in employee mode and you never think about the business that employs you, which is sadly a lot of you douchebags out there, diba? some of you are going to use the funds of the corporation and use it for your own, your own thinking and then you're going to justify it. Pa? That's loser mentality. Eh? You know how many people I've met like that using the funds of the organization for their own uses? My gosh, when I'm the boss, I'm going to sue the hell out of you if I catch you. That's what I do. I want to make sure that you become a cautionary tale and other people will regret. I'm going to make sure you don't get hired again uh -huh. in the same city. That's how it should be. You need to, learn, you need to lead with an iron fist. And uh, if you don't lead with an iron fist, you're never going to max out your profitability of your department because you will be abused. There are so many people who abuse. And uh, they abuse from left, right, top, and center. And uh, if they're not abusing, they're just plain not smart slash idiots. Uh, incompetent. Those are the other ones. They just want to make Apple. I don't know what Apple is in English. But uh, basically, they just want to be heard. But they don't really affect the bottom line that well. They're just making space, blowing their lips, and making chancing people in meetings. Yes, there are people like that. And I can't stand them. So you want to be mindful of people like that because you don't want to associate with bad people. The moment you associate with bad people like that, your operations, your leadership is compromised. Okay? And if you cannot weed out the bad apples, then it is you, my friend, that must leave. Anyways, profit and loss is really key and also does crisis management. If you're not able to handle crisis, which happens every now and then in every business, my gosh, chef, you don't know what crisis is. Being in the weeds, the mise en place, the shits for service, that's all well and good. But you know what? It ends the same day. It ends at the end of shift. I used to think it was such a difficult thing. What's more of a crisis is something that lasts a year. Management, abusive employees, etc., etc. Uh, terrible board of directors. Sometimes you have the most idiotic 
single board of director or there's two of them and they make life so difficult and you or you have a chismis person that you're friends with but later on uh they make chismis behind your back this is such a filipino thing so you want to be careful of this and the reason why uh this is such a big deal is a lot of us chefs are not prepared to do this because the chef in the kitchen the hierarchy is very militaristic but the moment the moment you hit corporate Oh my gosh, that's when the politics comes in. And if you're unable to navigate this political world of uh, Philippine corporate uh, structure, uh, you're gonna be, it's going to be quite difficult for you to really get far. You're going to have to eventually learn. And my suggestion is you want to maintain your integrity and excellence because a lot of the other people have already sacrificed theirs. And the moment you sacrifice integrity and excellence, uh, that just means that you don't have enough skills to do to it properly. So next point number eight, uh, understand compliance with the law, taxes, health, withholding tax, VAT, service charge, legal, tap food poisoning, safety, all of this. The reason why it's important is because you're running a big scale already and you don't want to be the cause of anything bad for the brand or the business. What You, you are actually supposed to be the safeguarder of the uh, integrity of the wholesomeness and safety of the business. So uh, because you're the one producing the food that's meant for consumption. So you have to set good places and ultimately like serve save, not just in food safety, but even in business, there are critical control points. And what you want to do is identify those critical control points and really nail those things down. Next is bullet number nine. You must have an eye for business innovation and market adaptation because you may be doing amazing this year but next year when the new hotel the new resort the new shipping line the new hospital the new office building of google facebook meta whatever opens beside you you're going to become old news and there's not and there's there's something so bad when an old when you're living on old victories you are quickly going to be defeated. You must always fight the current battle to win the future war. I'll say it again. You always fight the current battle to win the future war. Never live in the past. And that's why business innovation and market adaptation is a key skill for all executive chefs. Uh, Next is strategic competitive advantage. You want to be able to craft out strategic and competitive advantage with your other executives and managers so that uh, you can uh, maximize value to the customers. You can increase, for example, frequency or average check. You can increase average transaction size. Uh, Ultimately, this all leads down to customer lifetime value. Uh, Next, number 11, is uh, whenever you open, let's say, a new concept or a new menu or offering, it is also very good to understand strategic market positioning for long-term business sustainability. Okay, hindi lang tayo gagawa ng menu at ng gagawa ng menu. Uh, wag lang kayong gagawa ng menu para magpa-cute. Ang dami kasi gumagawa ng menu, magpapa-cute, trending sa Instagram, I'm gonna plate it like this. Dude, I don't care if you're gonna come out in these magazines and uh, awards. You know most of them... Are- Require payment anyway. You know how many emails I've gotten of awards, but I had to pay for that award. Never in my life have I paid for an award. Never. And uh, that's the job of marketing to do, to decide if they're going to take that path or not. But as a chef, uh, I believe you have to have integrity. And uh, for me, uh, excellence is unbuyable. But you have to create real strategic competitive advantage. And this happens in either the product, the pricing, the way that you promote, the bundling, etc., etc. So these are the tools that you can use. Don't use underhanded, disingenuous tools because they last. The, the, effects, of, the effects are so short and later on they're more damaging to you. What you want are long-term effects that are good and positive. So next up, is last also is just putting these all things together and mind you know it's a very difficult role executive chef because before all you had to do was worry about the food that ended up on the 
in the plate that ended up in the table of the customer. But this time now, what you have to do is you have to answer for all the inadequacies of your staff that you chose or maybe the past regimen chose or the processes that they're either working or not. You answer to all of it. And 